Hello and uh, welcome to Digital Culture and Language with me, Richard Pinner. Uh, today is the second of uh, the two special lectures about memes. Just want to do a quick review before we get into it um, about the content that we've already covered. Uh, first of all, the definition of meme, uh, the word meme coming from Richard Dawkins' 1976 book um, in relation to genes and specifically how memes are um, self-replicating patterns of information. And then this concept has then been taken into the more modern concept of a meme, uh, which we usually associate with a kind of picture, maybe a joke with some text. Um, but these are, th that's an oversimplification. A meme is actually a much more than just a single image. It's, it's a participatory... Um, event really where lots of people uh, contribute and repurpose things um, and but always kind of uh, sharing new developments around the same idea. Obviously participatory culture is a big part of how memes work by which we mean uh, a culture in which uh, people are not just expected to be consumers but they actually uh, participate actively and they even produce the product that they are uh, discussing or that they are uh, interacting with. Two very good books on the subject, um, Whitney Phillips and Ryan Milner's book The Ambivalent Internet and Ryan Milner's um, The World Made Meme. Milner actually wrote his PhD about memes and you can download his PhD for free from uh, the awarding institution. institution. Uh, it's a bit different, but you can actually get a free PDF uh, that's very similar to the main book. Milner argues that memes are a lingua franca for the internet. Um, basically, they allow people to communicate in a particular way across vast geographical and social contexts. Anyway, that's what we covered last lecture. Uh, today, what we're going to do is this. We're going to talk more about the humour of memes. Uh, we're going to talk about one particular example that was very famous. And then we're going to talk about deep fakes. Um, it's not exactly memes, but it's related uh, to the sort of Photoshop culture, um, the culture of editing videos and photos. And then we're going to show some um, examples of participation uh, specifically memes that my own students have made and we're going to invite you to make your own as well. So, what's so funny? You'll remember last lesson I talked about the ludic nature of online content. Um, a very good example of this sort of dark, edgy type of humour that characterises much of the digital culture, much of the memes and the internet uh, content that we see uh, is the Harambe meme. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Harambe meme, uh, Harambe was a gorilla. And uh, I have a YouTube video to explain it. Natasha Fada is following this story for us in the newsroom. So, Natasha, walk us through, you know, what we know so far. Well, what we know is that around 4 p.m., zoo officials say they started hearing people screaming around the gorilla enclosure and then quickly sealed off the area. And this is what they saw when they came on the scene, Renee. This four-year-old boy, they understand, felt 10 to 12 feet down into the moat in the gorilla enclosure. There were two female gorillas. They were far away. But this 400-pound male gorilla named Harambe came to the scene. You can see him clearly holding the boy between his legs and was sort of uh, jostling him a little bit. Some have described it as him dragging him through the water. But many say that he wasn't attacking the boy. In fact, he was just playing with him. But we're talking about a 400-pound animal. It could be potentially dangerous. It was described as a life-threatening situation for the boy. So within 10 minutes, the zoo officials had to respond and they deployed a special team that shot and killed the gorilla. Many have asked, why didn't you just tranquilize the animal? The zoo has responded that in fact, tranquilizing a 400 pound gorilla would take quite a bit of time for the tranquilizer to take effect and they couldn't endanger the boy. Here's what the zoo officials are saying today. 
they did the right thing, and yet it's a difficult day. The zoo's in the business of taking care of endangered animals, and we certainly don't want to be in a situation where they have to be killed. So the zoo is saying it was a very sad day for them. They are also saying that the boy has been transported to a hospital where he is being treated for his injuries. And what kind of reaction are you seeing uh, to this story out there? As you can imagine, lots of reaction. A an endangered animal has been shot and killed at a zoo that was meant to protect him. So many people questioning, what was the zoo's role in all of this? How could a four-year-old boy get access to the enclosure and be able to fall through? Uh, and many people wondering also, why did something like this have to happen while the zoo was still filled with people? Let's have a listen to a woman who was at the zoo at the time. It's very friendly, it's, everything is beautiful here, but when you see something like that and then you have the disappointment because how do, what do you say to your grandchildren? So as a result, a number of social media pages have opened up using the hashtag RIP Harambe. You can see that from this Facebook page. And lots of people also very upset because these animals could easily live uh, up to four, 40 years. And he was only 17. In fact, Harambe celebrated his 17th birthday just on Friday. Lots of questions about the zoo's behavior, the family's behavior, the parents in question, and whether this is the right way to tackle a situation like this. All right. Thanks, Natasha. You're welcome. Okay, so now Natasha you. Is... Sorry, now you know the sad story of Harambe. Um, okay, so that event took place, and of course, straight away there was um, a, an out, outburst of reactions to the event on social media, and of course, this is where people start to criticize um, what's happened and to to pick it apart to analyze it. Now, when we were doing the lesson uh, last time, uh, we were talking about um, Mark Jews's, uh three aspects of digital culture, um, which, which I will just show here again, uh, the uh, participation, bricolage, those, those were easy to see with the memes that we talked about in the last lesson, but the remediation one, we actually had uh, questions about what exactly is the re remediation aspect of these memes. Well, the remediation aspect comes from the ability for people to voice their opinions freely, um, to to express what they what they what they think about this situation, and to communicate um, kind of, in fact, in some cases directly with the officials and the people involved, or at least to know that their voice is very likely to be seen. So there's a sort of act, lack of censorship here, which is certainly very good in certain times. Um, one of the comments here, for example, as you can see, uh, it, when Harambe took better care of the kid than his parents. Uh, so people arguing that the, par the parents here are the ones at fault. Um, for not having taken proper care of their child. Um, what kind of moron lets a child fall into a gorilla enclosure? Um, sterilize the parents next. Uh, don't get mad at the zoo, get mad at the boy's parents, and the parents should be sued. So there was an outcry against the zoo, but there was a much bigger outcry against the parents for having allowed this kind of thing to happen. Um, and it's true. So then we start to see the memes arriving. And of course, the memes were a big part of how people participated, how they utilized bricolage, developing their own, um, their own uh, products, their own, their own memes, and the remediation aspect, them being able to talk about their opinions and express, uh, maybe, try, you know, in a way that they hope will try to make things better, I presume. Uh, but then also, the freedom of expression, which is a great thing, also leaves us open to um, other people expressing their ideas in, in ways that are not acceptable. So dank memes, for example, uh, not necessarily racist memes, but quite often get uh, there's a gray area between dank memes and racist memes or other taboos and here is a, an example which i've actually censored myself because i i didn't want to show a racist meme on my slides but um certainly there are plenty of them out there if you just look at them 
So, um, although there's a sort of remediation aspect, there's also a humor aspect of it. So people are, are criticizing the parents, but they're also making jokes at the same time. And this is one of the powerful things about comedy and satire in particular. And there is a satirical aspect uh, to to these memes quite often. Uh, and as uh, Dumet calls it, the ludic self on social networking sites. I showed this one already last week, um, but even AI computer, the neural network from ImageFlip seems able to contribute to this sort of very strange warped sense of humor that we see on our online memes. Okay, so moving on to the next section. Uh, this section will look at the meme loss. A very famous meme, one of the ones listed uh, in knowyourmeme.com's sort of most influential memes. Um, but what is this meme? What, what does it mean? Uh, where does it come from? So originally, Loss was a comic strip from Control-Alt-Delete's 2008 uh, issue of, of one particular um, strip. This is by artist Tim Buckley. Uh, usually... Control Alt Delete was very comical and light-hearted, but then in this one entitled Loss, uh, the the guy walks into the hospital and the um, the lead character from the comic strip, whose name is Lila, uh, has just suffered a miscarriage, and. Um, what was interesting here was that the, the the tone of the comic was very different from how it had previous previously been. Uh, people criticised it straight away for being too serious, not funny, um, in the wrong like the you know trying to be serious when when it had previously only been kind of light hearted, and getting the tone very wrong as well. Um, so this created what's called anti fandom. So where people sort of get really into it and sort of create their own versions, you know, as a criticism of it and a sort of tongue in cheek making fun of it. So one that we saw here was this loss meme. So um, the loss also became known as C uh, C A D abortion or CAD abortion, and basically. Um, very quickly afterwards, people started doing their own versions, and they're a little bit cryptic almost, as you can see here. Um, it's just a blue line, and then a blue and a purple line, and a blue and a grey line, and then a blue and a grey flat line. Um, but those mimic the character strips in the comic strip. Although it doesn't look instantly recognisable as a lost meme, this is a lost meme. This is exactly the same... Um, structure as the previous one. So a lot of these jokes were quite um, cleverly concealed in plain sight, as it were, um, making the in-joke all the more difficult for, for... If you didn't know about it, you might not see it kind of thing. As we talked about last week, if you don't get the meme, you're not part of the group. Here's another one uh, using graphs. Um, and I particularly like this one, uh, how capitalism actually works, how liberals think socialism works, how socialism actually works. Um, and then this one, every four panels is a meme, loss meme. Oh, every four panels meme is a loss meme. Sorry, I read it wrong. <laughs> On the 10th anniversary of the uh, 2008 Control-Alt-Delete panel, Tim Buckley uh, released a uh, parody, a self-parody, to show the comic book's main character looking directly at the audience with a sort of sly look on his face, breaking down the fourth wall um, and sort of self-referencing the fact that, yeah, okay, this has become a meme. Okay, so next uh, I want to just quickly show you uh, something that might be cause for concern. 
um, to do with uh, deep fakes. Now, I'm only going to show this video for a few seconds. Um, if you want to watch the full video, there'll be a link below. Um, obviously, I didn't make these videos, so I don't want to uh, use them too much in my own uh, YouTube video. Otherwise, YouTube will take my videos offline. But here we go. We'll just watch the first few minutes of this. Okay, it's pretty funny. Um, if you want to know what happens next, uh, there's a, you know, the guy comes running back in, there's a fight. Keanu kicks everyone's ass. Um, <laughs> and it's actually really funny. Um, anyway, there you go. So now, uh, what's a bit worrying about that? So what's a bit uh, concerning about that um, video is the fact that it's a deep fake. Keanu Reeves is not in that video at all. You can probably tell if you listen to the voice um, or you look at this slightly over exaggerated reactions, um, but it, it, it might look like Keanu is just doing a funny video because you can tell that that didn't really happen because it is just a bit over the top. But um, what you can't tell is that Keanu Reeves was not in the video at all. That that is a deep fake. Okay, so that's an actor playing Keanu, and then they have used um, special uh, sort of three D mapping uh, and video editing technologies to to map Keanu's face onto another guy's head. Um, and that video has received over 16 million views. And it's probably fair to say that probably quite a few people who saw that video might have believed Keanu was really in it. There's a documentary uh, about that deepfake and how they made it. And it's a channel, actually, that, that specialises in these deepfakes because they do take quite a lot of making to, to be this convincing. However, it's concerning because obviously a lot of the uh, stuff that comes out with memes, um, we see photos being shared widely and uh, we are, um, we're obviously seeing photos that have been edited, that have been photoshopped. Quite often someone else's head is stuck onto something. Now, most of the time it's pretty obvious that this has been done. As with this example, for example, for for instance, you can see that this is not a real bottle of Coke, and these are not real sunglasses that someone has just kind of you know cheaply photoshopped. They might not even use Photoshop for this; they might use some other uh, photo editor um, in order to to participate. And this is the bricolage aspect of the meme, of course, and it, it's supposed to be clear that that this has been done, you know, it's part of the joke that we, we, we know that it's bad Photoshop. But what if uh, it's more than just bad Photoshop? So a prime example of that would be the Pizzagate story. Uh, and what happened with this was um, that uh, fake news was being spread that there was some kind of child sex ring involving Hillary Clinton and a pizza restaurant. And this was made famous um, in 2016. And it actually led to a real life shooting in the pizza, uh, in the pizza restaurant. Somebody barged in uh, and just shot everyone in the restaurant, uh, thinking that it was that the fake news was real. And they were obviously very upset because of the nature of it. And this was all part of a kind of smear campaign against Hillary Clinton's uh, a bid for presidential uh, candidate um, in 2016. So although these are clearly fakes for a lot of people, uh, there is a, a concern that not everyone is able to kind of cut through it and realise what's real and what's fake on, on the internet. And memes are a way that things spread very quickly and memes often uh, are not just jokes and funny, but quite often they, they share news as well um, and, re and reactions to the news and they, and they give one side of the story. And the fact that they're very easily shared means that news can spread 
uh, more rapidly. And of course, there's the amplifying effect of the internet. Anyway, anyway, so here is uh, an example of a meme I made myself. Um, and you can see I don't have the best Photoshop skills there, but um, I wanted to sort of make my own meme. I hide the Harold, hide the pain Harold uh, with one of Damien Hurst's uh, sharks. And this was just to show the participatory nature of memes. So although there can be negative aspects of, of anything, I wanted to point out that, that this is for the for the main part, it's it's a it's it's a good aspect of memes that we can edit things, we can produce them ourselves, um, and uh, we're all kind of involved in participating in these conversations. Again, it's a good example of Mark Jews's three aspects of digital communication, a digital culture. I mean, uh, remediation, participation, and bricolage. So what I'd like to do now is make your own memes and post them in the forum. Um, so I'll give you a few minutes for that. One final thing that I wanted to share with you is the, um, the idea of group specific memes. So I'm a member of a group called What If, uh, what if Phones But Too Much, which is a Facebook group that has about 30 or 40,000 members. So it's a, it's a private group, but it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty big group. Uh, in 2018, uh, somebody posted this comment, which got a lot of attraction. I haven't learnt this group in months, but all of a sudden today it's my entire newsfeed. I'm not bothered, but I need someone to explain to me about the pail of water, please. So this group has its own humour, its, its own in-jokes, its own sort of you know, memes, and they often arise and develop as, you know, during discussions within the group. And this is the, the best place to sort of understand how memes happen uh, by being a member of a group that actually generates its own memes. So what happens is with the what if phones but too much group, uh, what we all do is we, we like to find Im images that could be technological determinism, I suppose, uh, images that show uh, people saying, "Oh, phones are bad," or you know, "Look at look at technology ruining our lives." But of course, there's always an irony to it. Um, so here's here's one famous cartoon: Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. The father's reading an old nursery rhyme, and the kid says, "To fetch a crummy pail of water, they should have been fetching Pokemon creatures." And then, "I love Pokemon Go" T-shirt there. So it's showing how our young people today are not interested in uh, the traditional nursery rhymes anymore because they're too bothered about Pokemon Go. Instantly, the, the cartoon was repurposed, bricolage, remediation, and, um, and participation all being involved here. Um, people have edited it, and you won't get this, but it's really funny if you're a member of that group. That old lady is the face of a lady who, th another from another meme or another image that was shared, um, everyone is looking at their phones, taking pictures of something, and the old lady is not looking at her phone. She's just enjoying being in the moment, or so they think. Uh, so that's a picture of her, the being in the moment lady. And then the cell phone, as in like cell, as in prison cell, and then here's the thing. She should have been living in the moment. And I love the fourth monkey. Um, I used to know what that meant, but now I've forgotten. Anyway, as you can see, uh, there's a lot of prior knowledge specifically only to this group that you would need to know in order to understand this meme. And this shows why the you know a lot of the humor of memes is often lost on people. It's nothing to do with the slang necessarily or the language used it's more likely to do with whether or not you belong in that group another one of the memes that come from the what if phones group is uh, we live in a society which is one of their sort of famous slogans um, these were some of the most popular memes um, to come out of that group 
a few years ago. Uh, to be honest, I stopped using Facebook in 2019 um, and rarely use it anymore, but um, I still include these because they're good examples of the kind of in-group uh, specific memes that you really wouldn't understand them unless you were part of the group at the time. Another aspect of memes is obviously whether or not they are current, whether they are relevant to us now. So this meme, uh, here's, um, here's quite a funny one of Neymar, and he was injured in a... Uh, well, he wasn't injured, that was the problem. He, he, he was sort of knocked over during a football match and hammed it up a bit more, like took it a bit too far um with the rolling and then people turned it into this hilarious joke where he's just sort of rolling too long um the Neymar keeps rolling and rolling so if you saw the match then it was probably hilarious but that was in 2018 now 2019 2020 2021 we we've probably forgotten about it it's moved on it's no longer very funny so what I wanted to do, rather than update my slides, uh, was just to show that old one and say, let's now look for current memes that will be funny to us right now. Okay. Uh, okay, so while we're talking about the Zoom memes, um, this was an interesting example that, that I found while I was looking for Zoom memes. Um, this journalist uh, named... Um, Flora Gill, uh, she changed her background during a, a Zoom meeting uh, to be so that she was the, the desirable red skirt girl in the famous um, meme. I think that's absolutely hilarious. But then she received an email from her boss and her boss has written, while I thought your Zoom background was funny, I have seen the memes and I think they're very good. I'm concerned it doesn't project the air of professionalism you should be striving for, perhaps just your apartment next time. And what's interesting about this is the issue of privacy. So um, this difference between privacy and professionalism what uh, what actually is um, is the right? So is it okay? obviously in this? You can see the background of my own house, and you could zoom in if you wanted to and look at certain items that I have behind me. You could see that, for example, that I have Lord of the Rings or Ursula Le Guin's Tales of Earthsea books. Um, but you you know you might also see other books. Perhaps maybe someone has a book behind them that isn't a book you agree with. Um, or something like that, and it, it sort of invades our privacy. So which is more professional, having a fake background or having the real, your real house? Which, where's the line between profess professionalism and privacy? Uh, somebody made a new meme for the meme, um, and of course things develop from there. So there's flora, there's professionalism, and there's the memes. So in my writing workshop class, I got um, I got my students making a, um, their own memes, and here are some of the ones. Um, this one specific to Sophia and Aoyama Gakuin. Uh, this one was funny, but I don't know why. Um, this one was was re related to one of the students whose name was Mana, who. Uh, wasn't doing well in her Spanish class. And this one was, I don't know why this is so funny, but this one was was one of the one of the best ones as well. Uh, so my students made their own memes and now I would like, oh, and this one, when you can't pronounce the TH, the th sound. So anyway, now I'd like you to have a go at making your own memes and share them um, in the in the coffee room. Okay, uh, final words. Um, so, although memes are the lingua franca of the internet, 
Um, they are also uh, a way that people are that groups are demarcated. So, for example, we've got um, something called Argo and Kant languages, which uh, Argo is basically a secret language used by various groups to make sure that outsiders cannot understand what is being said. So although they are definitely a lingua franca for the internet in some senses, they're also Argos uh, as well because they, they feature humorous references that only members of the group are going to get. So it it is a lingua franca on the one end, but it, it can also act as a cant or an argo uh, at the other, sort of excluding people and keeping groups tightly formed and keeping the group identity very specific. So what is your reflection on the things that we've talked about today? Let's move it over to the coffee room. Uh, thank you very much for watching.